So uh, thanks for coming out on a snowy day. Um, I'm going to probably run through too much stuff here, but that's the way these things go. And my goal is to give a flavor of the kind of research we've been doing and to think about maybe some of the philosophical context for it, because I am a philosopher after all, but hopefully show you some of the actual concrete modeling work we've been doing. And I was thinking about how this fits also into network science. And you'll see pictures of networks in some of this. And, and I was thinking about the difference between something like a railway network, where it's very clear what's in the network and what's not, or maybe not so. And then words, which we're often inducing a network structure on something else. And a lot of what I'm doing is more like maybe using a network model rather than finding something that is, that is actually a, a well-defined definitive network within the, within the materials that we have. So just um, to get us started here, um, of course, we all are familiar with this statement. In the beginning was the word. Um, and the word was something like logos. Um, and that has a modern counterpart, which has inspired a lot of the semantic computational modeling work from Firth. You shall know a word by the company it keeps. So the idea that we can get at something to do with words by looking at what their context is. But as a matter of fact, um, that has led to things like uh, WordNet, where one can uh, get lists of synonyms for words. Um, and building on that, things like Visual Thesaurus, which, which take basically the WordNet data and let you explore it graphically. Um, and then our own kinds of projects, where we're interested in comparing um, different kinds of documentary sources or textual sources and trying to figure out what the relationships might be among uh, items within those sources. And taking this word-centered approach, um, we do things like this, where it's going to be hard for me to explain this diagram fully, but we, we model a pair of online encyclopedias in philosophy, in this case, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is the SEP, and the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is the IEP. We lay out a bunch of words that are uh, semantically related to each other according to some model. In this case, we're using Mike Jones's Beagle model. Um, so we, we use a common model to get the, the relationships between the terms. And then we highlight which, which connections are stronger in which of those two sources. So in this particular case, the, the focal word was Turing. We picked the 100 strongest, most associated words according to the model in the two encyclopedias, which gave us about 140 or 50 words overall, lay them all out, and more highly colorized the Stanford Encyclopedia words rather than the Internet Encyclopedia words in blue. Uh, red for the Stanford and blue for the, for the uh, IEP. And what one sees here, if one inspects these nodes, is that the Stanford Encyclopedia goes much more into Turing's connections to formal discussions of computation, computational theory, things like the halting problem, even the German word and Scheidung's problem shows up here. Um, whereas the, the IEP discusses Turing's work uh, in a much more general context, which the SEP also discusses, but in a much more general context of implications for thinking about human intelligence, human nature, human mind, and so on. So these kinds of visualizations are helpful for trying to get a, a large-scale uh, view of what the difference is between two big blocks of text. Um, but as I say, we rather induce this structure, because after all, <clears throat> in the model, every word has some relationship to every other word. It's just a vector space model, and every word is a vector. And, in the space, and we can measure the distance between those vectors, in this case using cosine. Um, and so there's no particular reason why we select these, except these are the stronger ones. And setting the threshold is rather arbitrary just to show what it is that we're interested in showing at any given moment. So in the beginning, there was, I'm going to say, logocentrism. There was this idea that words are the things we ought to be focused on. And you see this, of course, in word, word clouds and tagging and all the other things that go on in this kind of area. Um, but what if logocentrism is wrong? So this is the more philosophical part of what I want to say. And in particular, um, there's a longstanding tradition going back, uh, what one might say, to the late 19th century with people like Frege of thinking about how larger units of meaning are composed out of smaller units of meaning. And in particular, starting in Frege's case with concepts which corresponded to words, and seeing everything is built up from there. So the meaning of a sentence was supposed to be a function of the meaning 
of the words in the sentence, the meanings of the words in the sentence, and then larger structures would be functions of those uh, smaller structures. But even in Frege, that story is a little bit complicated because Frege himself knew that certain words in certain contexts didn't mean what they normally meant outside those contexts. And his, one of the puzzle cases for him, actually, although we won't go into it today, is the uh, discussion of, of indirect speech or indirect re reporting. So if I say that um, I think that my neighbor is a nice person and it turns out that my neighbor is a mass murderer, then it could be said that I think that a mass murderer is a nice person. In one sense, that's true. In another sense, that's not true. So the words mass murderer there aren't exactly playing the same role depending how you understand that, that report of my speech or my mental state, right? Um, and so in the 20th century, many developments in trying to understand meaning and context uh, have led to all sorts of things, uh, in particular the field of pragmatics, um, and the idea that maybe in some way contextual-based meaning and meaning in use is prior to the more uh, point-like meaning that people often want to assign when they look at something in a dictionary or, or look up synonym lists and so on. Now, I happen to think that this is, a, is an appropriate approach, but it's a long way, uh, it's a lot more than I can say right now about uh, ways in which it's been approached that I think are not necessarily as productive as some of the other alternatives which relate to the kinds of models I'll be talking about in the second part of the talk. Um, but there's been resistance to this kind of pragmatics first approach to meaning uh, from some very notable individuals. Um, so for instance, Chomsky says a theory of pragmatics is impossible. Why? Because you'd have to have a theory of everything. Why? Because potentially anything is, re is relevant to the interpretation of any given sentence or, or string of words. And further, his philosophical uh, protege, uh, well, but he's a bit too old to be called a protege anymore, but uh, he was a student of, of Chomsky's, um, also argues that you can't have a general theory of context or a general pragmatic approach to language because the, it, it threatens a kind of global holism where anything might be relevant. But I want to say these are actually opinions from the armchair. There's Chomsky in his armchair. Um, because while one can think of what might be relevant in any given context, as a matter of fact, in actual context, the real, those kinds of contexts, in, in actual materials, those kinds of contexts are limited, and we can go after modeling them. And so what we want to approach then is what I've called in the title here, meaning at multiple scales. The idea that that context itself can have multiple scales. So a word in a sentence can mean one thing. That sentence in another context can give that word another, another meaning. Right? John put the pot in the dishwasher. The police were coming to dinner, so John put the pot in the dishwasher. Right? Um, the word pot flips meaning in that different context, and you can scale this up arbitrarily. So in conjunction with work with Cathy, we first tried to get a handle on um, a big picture of how philosophy in particular, because that's the era I'm coming from, uh, relates to uh, a very big network, a very big context, namely scholarly publications, mostly in science, but also over in this bottom left-hand corner, bottom right-hand corner, excuse me, the humanities. And we are um, particularly uh, here showing from the Stanford Encyclopedia articles where, and this is work that Robert Light also at the back uh, was engaged in, where philosophers are citing science. And in theory or in practice, we can also look at the reverse. Where are scientists referring to philosophy? And one of the projects we pursued with some NEH funding was precisely to go after one particular corner of this, in particular an area that's central to my own research, comparative psychology, and look at the way in which certain kinds of philosophical content is showing up in the science. Um, and so what we did was we went to the Hattie Trust collection, and at the time and still we had only access to the non-copyrighted portion of that pre-1923. That turns out to be all right because it's a very interesting period for the origins of comparative psychology. After the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, the next 50 years sees all sorts of developments in which arguments are put forth by psychologists, both for why they should be a different discipline from philosophy and also for why they should 
uh, adopt experimental methods and avoid anthropomorphizing animals. So we went into the Hattie Trust collection and tried to pull with just a keyword search a large set of books which might be relevant to this dispute. So we just used words like anthropomorphism and Darwin and comparative psychology to pull a set. And we pulled a set of 1,315 books, which are shown here laid out on that same map of science, the UC San Diego map of science that Kathy and Robert work with, um, and showing some of the volumes that we pulled. And from my perspective, as somebody who uh, is a philosopher by training, a historian and philosopher of science, um, also here at IU, we want to be able to go from these big high-level views down into the very detailed readings that are the bread and butter of, uh, of humanity's work in this area, right? Trying to make sense of particular texts. So this is just a screenshot of a little interface we have which lays out those volumes on that map of science. The, the books are sort of out in white space or where we're trying to average a couple of conflicting pieces of data. So this is by no means a perfect map. But you can see that we can click on any of these nodes and get information from uh, the metadata about those uh, entities. And then you can click on the link for the Hattie Trust link and go read the actual book if you want to, which is nice. OK, so you want to know what's showing up in the area of uh, earth sciences and this particular set that we pulled with those keywords. You can go, go look for it. But uh, it's still rather large scale. You dumped a book on my lap that's not necessarily clear what I want to do with that. So we've been exper experimenting a lot with uh, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation LDA topic modeling. This is a technique from Bly and colleagues in 2003. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. Let me just say something very uh, basic about topic modeling here um, and why I'm pursuing it. First, I'm pursuing it because it, it's a very interesting technique, but I'm no, by no means advocating it as the only way to find interesting structure in text. It just turns out to be one way which does something useful for us. Second, the word topic here is a, being used in a technical sense, which <clears throat> shouldn't be confused in your minds with the ordinary English um, notion of topic. So here we go again, right? The word topic in this context doesn't quite mean what you might think it means. Although, in some instances, it means something close to what you think it means. Formally, a topic in one of these topic models is a probability distribution, the total probability distribution over all of the words in your corpus. And so having some number of topics means having that number of probability distributions, which assign different probabilities to the different terms in the corpus. All right? So we might have a topic. For instance, from this 1,315 book uh, collection that, that we got with anthropomorphism and so on, we might have a couple of topics where anthropomorphism appears you know, with a relatively high probability, and in others it will appear with next to zero probability. Right? Um, and then a way to think about this intuitively in terms of the intuitive notion of topic is if I'm talking to you uh, in the area of philosophy of religion or theology, anthropomorphism is one of the concerns, anthropomorphic gods, right? Attributing human-like qualities to the gods. If I'm talking to you in the other area that I've introduced, namely comparative psychology, anthropomorphism also has a fairly high probability because here it means attributing human qualities to animals, right? But in both of those topics, that has a relatively high probability of occurring, but other words will have different probabilities, all right? And what, a topic, what the LDA topic model does is treat your document set as a mixture of topics, um, and the topics that I've explained as probability distributions over the words. So you can think of it as a generative model. If you, have, if you want to generate some set of documents, first pick a topic according to the probability distribution right, for an expected document, right, and then pick a word from that and iterate until you've got as many words um, uh, in your generated document as you uh, as in the, the document that you're trying to model, and now try to uh, apply some kind of reasoning, machine reasoning process to adjust both of those parameters, what is, what's the topic mixture and what's the probability distribution for the topics for each of the generated documents in comparison to each of the documents that you started with. So you can, in an iterative process, actually train the model up to, to discover something about the structure of the, uh, of the document set that you started with. So again, I'm not going to be able to take you through this in, in any detail. But once we've got that, we can actually go to work on our 1,315 volumes 
and find topics which are highly loaded on one or more words that interest us, and then use those topics to select documents uh, that are highly loaded on those topics. And this has the advantage of a keyword search because in many cases, and I'll show a specific example in, in, in about five minutes, um, <clears throat> in many cases, uh, you end up matching things where the words that you start with don't appear at all. Right? And this is what gives it some of its power. One more side is that some of the topics you get look like junk topics. They might have a lot of words that, that you would regard as filler words, would, could, should, which you can either stop out beforehand or you can actually treat them as interesting markers of other kinds of stylistic issues. And so one person's junk is another person's treasure. We try to be inclusive in this way. And in this case, you see that when I pick a topic with anthropomorphism as my keyword, I get a God, religion, life, man. So what this is showing is the highest probability words in that topic. And I get another one, which is animals, evolution, life, animal, right? So, so I've already, with just that single word, probed and found two topics that fit the two notions of anthropomorphism that I uh, started with. And we can actually map out the relationship among the topics by clustering them, because the topics are not orthogonal, because they're, they're remember, they're probability distributions, so they're not orthogonal axes here. We can actually cluster them. Um, and this is the result of some work by Dury Lee. Um, where we were kind of interested in what the relationship is between topic models when you have a low number of topics and when you have a high number of topics. This is typically a parameter you specify in training the model, showing that they do in fact cluster. And although, again, I'm not going to be able to go through this in any detail, what we find here in these big T's are, this is a 20 topic model. These two down here are things that have to do with religion in some way. T10 is uh, the first five words in it are among also named God's people, and it's a very generic religion topic. T14, religion, church, Christian, spirit, Christ. You see, that's a much more specific Christian topic, both equally represented in this 1,315 volumes. And of interest are these topics in between, which could fit in either category. And we can also confirm that the topics that are put by the clustering algorithm away from the other actually are more specific. So if I just pick one, like 151, that's the top five words in that are church, Catholic, century, Roman, England. Clearly specific to Christian, right, but not so much to general religion. Okay, so the power of the method is there. And we, can, we want to dig deeper, though. We want to get down to specific arguments, specific points at the interface between philosophy and science. And so what we did was we picked the topics that looked most relevant, in particular to the comparative psychology issues, remodeled 86 of the 1,315 volumes that were selected from those topics at the level of individual pages. So instead of treating whole documents as, uh, excuse me, whole books as documents, we treat individual pages as documents. And then we can find pages that load highly on topics that come out of that model. And then we can actually go into the book and find those pages and start in a manual process done by colleagues in the UK to actually map out the arguments there. So this is an example of an argument map de derived from that process of drilling down. And then we've got something very interesting, because we can take the books that have the most content that we want, and we can remodel the book as a corpus with each sentence as a document. And we can do the comparison, again, at the level of sentences. And in this case, what I did was pulled out a sentence from the uh, argument that's in this diagram here right, and looked for most similar. So the, the sentence we start off from this argument is, every statement that another being possesses psychic qualities is a conclusion from analogy, not a certainty. It's a matter of faith, obviously very relevant to the anthropomorphism. This is my favorite thing that it finds out. Um, we speak, for example, of an angry wasp, right? No word overlap at all, clearly very relevant to the issues that we're interested in. And we can go into the book and see where that is. And I can say more about some of those others, but I shouldn't. So we can also map the, the arguments with relation to each other through the topic model structure. So we can get a network of arguments. This one actually crosses multiple editions of the same book. Um, and we can even take parts of arguments and try to see whether we can use the topic structure to induce a structure that gives us an argument structure. And that's partly what our Dundee colleagues have tried to do. So what's meaning? at multiple levels, well, I think rather than thinking of it as a dictionary lookup, right? what do we do to demonstrate understanding of meaning? Well, we describe appropriately, we paraphrase, we give examples, um, and we in the world act appropriately. 
And the topic models in that table I showed you at the census level actually gives us examples of at least the second and third of these, right? Very close ways of stating similar points and then specific examples like the angry wasp. And then finally, can this be made more accessible? And I'm not going to be able to give you a live demo here. But we have built a topic explorer, which you can get to at infodata.cogs.indiana.edu, running over various demo corpuses. You can go in and uh, select a document by t starting to type the name of it, and it will fill it in. We've got one for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, one for the Happy Trust, one based on the original AP Press corpus that uh, Bly did in the original uh, report of the work. Um, and once you go there, if you pick the Animal Mind, the Textbook of Comparative Psychology, the book I was just talking about, you can find all of the other books that are similar in this topic space. You can actually compare the topic distribution within those volumes, and here we've got a second edition of the same volume, so you can see how much the topic distribution changes between. And there are various other affordances this has, so I can't show it here, but if you click out to this side, you can go read the book, right? You can get to the Happy Trust material. Um, you can also resource so if you decide you're really interested in retrograde degeneration in the spinal nerves. That's a book from this selection, right? You can click on this line and it will pop up to the top. And you can also focus in and say, all right, it's really this topic over here. And what I'm not showing is if you hover over these, then over there you'll get the first 10 or so words showing you what the, you know, so you can take a guess at what that topic is about. So mostly here, thanks, and thanks for your attention. And I'm more or less right on time, I think, for some questions. So good, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Andy.